introduction given on myself, um, but I'll just introduce myself. My name is Nadine. Um, I'm trained as a counsellor primarily, uh, but I deal with NLP, CBT and uh, uh, hypnotherapy as well. Uh, my work is based here in Rochdale, so I work for a charity called High Level Northern Trust, and it's very local to yourselves. It's um, on Drake Street in Champers Hall. Um, what the charity does is it, it's a recovery service for people that struggle uh, with addiction, drugs and alcohol. Um, what the charity does is help people get off the substance and then stay off the substance as well. Towards the end of the presentation I'll be giving you a bit more in-depth um, information about what the, actual, the charity does, how you can actually refer into the charity and some more details uh, regarding it all. Um, the presentation that I'm going to be giving today, um, there's a couple of things that um, I'm going to touch on. So initially it starts off with mental health, okay? And the reason why is I want to show um, why mental health is important, firstly, um, and then where substance misuse actually comes in. Then talk about substance misuse itself um, and its impact that it has on the individual and on society itself as well, and why it's important that we actually look at dealing with the issue and why it's not just the individual's problem but a collective problem. Um, and thirdly, just to kind of spread the awareness about the support that's available as well. So addiction is a very, very tough area to work in. And the reason why is sometimes, I mean, when we speak about um, uh, substance misuse and we're gonna be, you're going to hear me use the word addict, okay? Um, I'm not kind of validating the actions of the addict in any way. But what I'm asking is that we separate the addiction from the addict because the addict himself is just a human being, okay? And human beings are prone to making errors and mistakes. Um, but the problem with it is the addiction itself can cause a difficulty in the life, not just of the person, but in the people around him as well. So once a person becomes dependent on substances, he can do some horrific things to, to basically fund the addiction. Um, and it can cause Addiction is one of them things that leaves a string of victims in its wake. So it's a difficult area to work with because many people get hurt in the process. Um, so that's just something that I wanted to, to kind of highlight at the beginning. But kind of going into the presentation, hopefully I won't be taking too long. It will be around 40 minutes and I'll try and keep within the time. I know in other presentations I have gone off here and there, but I will try and keep it to, to 40 minutes. Um, so basically beginning, what is mental health? Why is mental health? Uh, important, okay? So mental health it includes uh, emotional, psychological, social well-being, everything, okay, comes into it though. How we feel, how we uh, think and act, okay? Having good mental health means that we can be the best versions of ourselves, okay? So that we can be the most productive versions of ourselves. We can engage in our relationships, in the work that we do in the community, in our family, um, in every aspect of our life in a very <coughs> positive way. Now in CBT we have a kind of what we call an interactive model where our environment, okay, or the things around us impacts us. Um, so if we have very kind of negative viewpoints on the world or the situations that we encounter in life, it affects our behaviour and, and you know it affects the way that we actually uh, engage with different aspects of our life. So having good mental health is very very important because it means that in general we're in a state of thriving, okay, in different areas of our life, okay, um, and life is always going to throw curveballs at us, okay? But it means that we can handle them in a better way and be the most productive versions of ourselves. So, why is it important, okay, to have good mental health? Because mental health affects everything, okay? We learn to cope again, we can become healthy in all aspects of our life, okay? We can become involved in our communities, we take responsibility of our lives, uh, and we improve our relationship with ourselves, and with our families and with everyone else. So mental health is very, very important. Now I just want to put some statistics in about um, the why I'm actually here today. And we'll go back on to where substance misuse comes in to um, play with, with mental health. So the reason why I'm out here in the South Asian community, okay, is because out of all the kind of um, engagement that drugs and alcohol, so this is off the government website, you know, the statistics, um, you'll probably see that 84% of it is made up by, you know, people from a white background, okay, with another 5% is made up from uh, other white groups, okay. The ethnic minorities are very, very reluctant to engage in drugs and alcohol uh, services, 
Um, in fact, you know, a kind of minority makes up at least 1% of, of, of people engaging. So there's very, very low engagement from uh, the South Asian community. However, we know that alcohol and drugs is a massive risk. We know that there's uh, a lot of usage, especially in cannabis. Um, currently as well, you're going to see a slide that I've added in uh, on nitrous oxide, which is very, very common now, and it's becoming a massive problem. Um, so there's a lot of people that are stuck on it. There's alcohol uses growing as well. Um, we, as, as, as globally, I guess, but even as communities as well, we've been through a very difficult period with COVID. Um, and we know that through this period, okay, there's been a massive upsurge in, in people struggling with their mental health, but also in dependency on drugs and alcohol. When you saw, or when things were going on with COVID, we see people stockpiling, yeah? Um, there was a lot of memes and jokes as well about some of this on, on social media, some of the things that people were stockpiling. But what we didn't see was people were actually stockpiling alcohol and drugs as well, because they thought, well, we're not gonna get access to them. What that meant is people had, you know, hundreds of pounds worth of, of substances. Now, generally the people that were struggling with mental health or people that use uh, substances will have some of these underlying issues. Forcing them into isolation with a load of uh, drugs and alcohol means that they went through that stash very quickly. Now the thing with drugs and alcohol is when people start using it, the more you use, the more your body kind of acclimatizes to it and then the more you need. Um, so it became a big problem people becoming dependent on drugs and alcohol, being stuck at home through this COVID period, with fear of not having access to it, it meant that there a lot of things went on. So alcohol misuse itself is one of the biggest risk factors for death. In fact, the NHS, one of the biggest burdens on the healthcare system is through alcohol itself. Now, in this country, it's a big problem because alcohol is legal, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of people just think, well, you know, it's, it's just one of them things. The point from social drinking to dependency sometimes can be so subtle that the individual doesn't know but let me tell you something that alcohol is probably just as dangerous as class a drugs even like heroin once a person becomes dependent and is stuck on alcohol um, they need to be reduced or either sent to a detox or rehab to get them off it otherwise it will just kill them it can kill that individual so it's very very uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous. I mean, if it was to be recategorized, um, my own perspective is that it should be in a class A, but I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, it is, it is, it's actually really dangerous and it's one of the biggest burdens on the NHS. And it's becoming common within our community as well. Um, so it is something that needs to be, you know, one of the reasons why we're actually out here as well. Um, a lot of these, the, the kind of drugs and alcohol, the statistics, the, the usage that comes, it comes from some of the deprived areas uh, or you know, um, mostly deprived areas. And over half of these have got issues with mental health anyway. So this is about the, a, bit, a bit of a statistic about the pandemic, okay? So cocaine use became one of the most uh, prominently, relevant used drugs, okay? In Europe, from 2018 onwards, it became something that was, uh, you know, being used en masse. Um, and the bottom statistics is a really interesting one with the government website. Because it says, obviously, it talks about you know the usage in black adults, white adults, okay, and it talks about Asians, but it's only 3.4 percent. I was looking at this, and obviously, working in this area and being out and he healing stuff, um, I don't actually think that's a true reflection of it. And one of the reasons why is because of the stigma that's attached to drugs and alcohol within our community. But we're going <clears> to <throat> look at stigma at the end of the presentation as well, and on on on, on what's going on within the community, because there is a lot of people that come to the service but are very reluctant um, and are very concerned, okay? And we'll talk about confidentiality as well again at the end of how we would kind of deal with some of these things and I'll take some questions around it as well. But the stigma that's attached, especially within our community, is very strong. It's strong for the males but it's even double that for the females. Uh, and basically what it means is there's a lot of people that might be struggling with drugs and alcohol that are just not coming out or reaching out for the help that they need. So, back to mental health and substance misuse. So, since the, well, even before COVID, I guess, but in COVID, we've had an upsurge in mental health presentations coming in. And um, this is uh, kind of linked to what we see in the charity ourselves or what we've been kind of dealing with. Um, depression and anxiety have been massive. Uh, going back to some of the statistics, I was looking at uh, prescribed medication for um, um, depression, 
okay, so antidepressants. Since 2018, they've surged. Now, I know that antidepressants get prescribed for many different things, not just depression only, but there's a big surge in, 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 it, in what's happening. In the anxiety, we have, um, in adolescence, we've got some of the highest cases now that are, are, are kind of rising uh, all the time. So depression and anxiety is a massive thing that's been coming in. Trauma, PTSD, phobias, eating disorders, when lockdown people were stuck inside, one of the things that they were complaining about was gaining weight, okay? Um, comfort eating, uh, a lot of these kind of things that came on. Then, as a result of the weight gain, people were uh, stopping eating, and there was all sorts going on, okay? So there's eating disorders. But one of the things that came in was the addictive behaviors as well. So what happens is, generally, when people struggle with their mental health, um, they kind of look at ways that which they can manage, which they can actually manage it. Um, and what they do is learn behaviours to help them or make it easy for them. So one of the things that they might do is kind of like go into denial or there's nothing wrong with me. And you get this in addiction a lot. I've never ever come across an, addict, uh, uh, an alcoholic that says uh, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, you know, that happens very, very down the line. Initially it will say, no, I haven't got a drink problem or I will drink every now and then. Say, so can you stop? No, I can't. You know, and, and then it's when you look at the units and stuff, what they should be drinking. and. Uh, you know, it's like six times the amount of what they should be doing or the, the amount of drugs that they're taking is, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. And until they actually see that, they actually live in this place that, no, I, you know, I can, I can stop. Every addict thinks I can just stop until they come to a point. And this is why I said that um, line between usage and, and dependency is sometimes so subtle that the person doesn't realise. It's only when they try to stop, they realise, hold on, I can't stop. Um, so. You know, there's denial that comes in, avoidance, people just kind of locking themselves away or, or trying to distract themselves. There's emotional eating, compulsive spending, but substance misuse comes in there as well. And one of the reasons why people come towards substances is it's either used to heighten pleasure or to dull pain. But from my experience of what I've seen, it's majority of the time it's there to dull pain. It's a quick fix, okay? person has emotional... Um, feels emotionally overwhelmed, okay, doesn't know how to deal with the circumstance, the drugs and the alcohol will dull that pain within minutes, okay, um, and, the, and, the, and the individual just doesn't want the discomfort of them feeling, but what they don't realise is they always wake up to the same problems, okay, drugs and alcohol might be a quick fix to dulling pain, but it never ever eliminates the pain, and this is something that needs to be put out there it's, it's not an answer it's not a solution to anything in fact it makes things worse okay it exasperates the, the situation because what happens is the, once a person gets caught up into that lifestyle obviously there's a financial burden towards it as well but the physical harms that it does to the person the mental harm that it does to the person it just means that they don't really learn the skills that they need to learn to be able to deal with life situations so one of the ways that we actually uh, developing life is actually going through hardships, isn't it? We would be our mistakes, our greatest teachers. We have a situation, we don't know what to do with it, we find it difficult, we ask people, we learn, we develop, and we then we build that emotional resilience. The, 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 the um, addiction is one of the things that stops that whole process, it just stills the pain, and, and that's it. But a person always kind of wakes up to them, same problems. So, when the mental health takes a bit of a dip, Okay, and people struggle, this is one of the times when people become most vulnerable, okay, and a lot of that times substances can come in there and, and people can get caught into that cycle. So what is substance misuse itself? Okay. So it can be using any kind of hazardous psychoactive substances okay, in, in a way that's hazardous to health. Uh, it can be alcohol, it can be drugs, glue, gases, prescribed medication any of these things, and people that use substances, they know um, that the substances are dangerous, okay, but they will still actually use them. Um, now, this is a tough one, this one, because I've encountered different things in, in, in my time of working with addiction. Some people will say, you know, it's easy to kind of just step in and say, or, or make an immediate judgment and say, well, that's the wrong thing to do. Um, but the, the thing is, sometimes some people go through such adverse circumstances that they say the only thing that kept him alive was the substance itself, otherwise they would have killed themselves. Um, so it's a very, very difficult area to, to kind of cover. But, you know, um, again, you know, they will always know that any addict would know that this substance at some point is 
potentially could kill me, um, but they will still take it. And the reason why they take it is because they can't deal with the, the distress and the pain that they're having, okay? And they just want a quick way of alleviating that. Um, so basically that's where substance comes in. Now I've put this slide in and I just put this in just yesterday. And the reason why I've done it, okay, is just to raise a bit of an awareness around nitrous oxide. Now, there's a lot going on from the council, the police, okay, and from other drug and alcohol services uh, around pretty much all of England. Have any of you seen these kind of silver canisters lying around? Yeah? I mean, I don't know if you know what they are, okay? But these are, these are this is nitrous, nitrous oxide, and people use this, okay? They put it in balloons and they inhale it, okay? Or they can inhale it directly from the canister, but it's very, very dangerous. It's, it's a kind of odorless dust, okay? And it's inhaled from balloons, like I said. Uh, or it can be inhaled from the canister, but it's very dangerous. Now, what the problem with this is, is these have become available now in the big can in these big canisters, right? And they're cheap, and they they come available. But the thing is, is now that they're in these massive canisters, people are using them a lot more often, and they in and they're using massive qualities of them as well. You know, when I first started in in working in drugs and alcohol, and um, this was about four or five years ago. Um, I was called as a, as a therapist to um, evaluate a young, a young man, he was only in his 20s or something and um, basically he was having a lot of psychological problems. Um, so I came in, I spoke to him, um, I bought um, what you call kind of like um, self-measuring tools around depression and anxiety and he scored perfect in all of them, he didn't have a single problem in there. But one of the things was, is he was having massive problems within his body. He was on crutches at the time. He was bedbound for months. Um, and um, he was having pains. He didn't kind of, couldn't really confuse. He was a really bright kid. All of a sudden, his education just went out the window. He dropped out of college and everything. Um, and he was having a lot of problems. And I could not figure out what was wrong with him. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, is, is there something going wrong with him? The doctors didn't know what was going on. Didn't know why he was losing function in his body. You understand? They were confused as well. So as we were talking uh, through the whole process and I asked him about drugs and alcohol and, and he said, no, I'm not taking anything like that. And he said it to me about two, three times and I couldn't, it, I couldn't make sense of it. Then at the end of it, he said to me, oh, I occasionally have laughing gas. Yeah? And I thought laughing, he didn't even consider it a drug. Um, so, you know, the, the website Talk to Frank, I went on that and had a look at what laughing gas, because I was quite intrigued as well of what it is. And I actually found out what it is. And it is actually nitrous oxide. And what it does is it causes B12 deficiency, deficiency, okay? And what that does is it basically damages the nerves in the body and this is what we're having. Now the doctors were thinking that he could possibly have MS, um, but they couldn't understand what was going wrong, with how we, what was happening or anything with it. But basically the gas that he was using nearly caused him to become fully paralyzed. And this is common. These canisters, I was, you know, going back about a month ago, I was in a restaurant, and there was a canister on the floor, in the restaurant. My local mosque, I see, I see him around there as well. You've probably seen him around in the community, here and there, okay? When people have these, generally they, they, they sit in their cars and they have them, and they're having them while they're driving as well. Uh, causes drowsiness, dizziness, confusion. It's basically like drink driving, in a sense, do you understand? There's a possibility that they can cause accidents. Um, it causes paranoia, sound distortions, hallucinations, and there's people even that suffocate from it. The, having it in a massive canister like that means that you can have a massive quantity of it, and, and there are people that have actually died from suffocation. Um, so it was just kind of building an awareness. If you see some of these around there, I mean, people just think that, ah, it's not dangerous, it's just laughing gas or whatever it is. No, it's actually really, really dangerous. So this is one of the reasons why I actually bought it. In this presentation, you'll notice that I don't really go into much of the, the drugs and that, that are available in the, in, in, on the streets or outside. Um, as, as Brother Nabil mentioned, these kind of presentations are basically to get an awareness around the support that's available in Rochelle, firstly. There will be hopefully future events where we'll come back and we'll be talking more in depth on actually the drugs that are available and what's going on with them or what's available in the streets. Um, and you know how we can actually spot people using mm -hmm. substances and what we can do about it, how we can intervene early on. Um, so, what impact does substance have on the individual and on the society? Now, sometimes we just think, well, the guy that's having it is his problem. And it's not really, okay? One of the problems with drugs and alcohol is it sometimes it's glamorized. 
in the movies, okay? Um, alcohol, you have, you have, you know, um, TV adverts and all sorts, you know, where people are holding a pint and they're happy. And uh, people think, well, you know, it makes you happy. No, it doesn't actually. It makes it, it makes, it's a depressant. Alcohol is a depressant. And it's, it's weird because when you have people that are suffering with depression and the antidepressants and then they're having alcohol at the same time, it's counterintuitive, it doesn't work, okay? But it is a depressant. And the world of alcohol and drugs and all of these things is glamorized in a way as well. It's, it's kind of associated with every vice that you can think of, money, wealth, fast cars, big houses, and stuff like this, where it's all rubbish, okay? It's deceit and deception. None of it is actually true. Um, the only destination that addiction provides to a person is to his grave, okay? Anyone that gets caught up in drugs and alcohol will tell you one thing, okay? Is it will take everything. It might give you that moment's relief, but it will take everything. And it will take the job, it will take your And I don't care about how, how much your loved ones love you, okay? And you know, that wife might be really supportive and say, I'm with you through thick and thin. But one, what happens is when people develop an addiction and you start robbing and doing all, or people start robbing and doing all of these things, people eventually get tired. And there's it's common knowledge every addict will tell you. There'll come a point in life where the person will say to them, or the partner, or, or whoever it is that supporting them will say to them, Look, either change your ways or I'm leaving. It will take everything. It will take the job, take the, the one of the most common, because we, we take referrals from everywhere, okay, um, within uh, organizations within Rochdale. Um, and a lot of the times it's child, children and social services. Parents get caught up in addiction, children get taken off them. Okay? Um, so you lose your children. Uh, people will lose your children, friend, family. It will take your health. It, will take, it absolutely takes everything from an individual until it takes his life and his death. That's the only, addiction, that's the only destination addiction really takes you towards. Okay? It is a temporary relief, okay? But people wake up to the same problems. It's a world where there's cheating, lying, stealing, betrayals. Uh, debts, ducking and diving, secrecy, all of these things come in. But drugs, drugs and alcohol is very specific. If you look at any violent crimes or any serious crimes, be it domestic violence, grooming, human trafficking, sexual exploitation, drugs and alcohol will be involved somewhere. So it's linked to some of the most horrendous things uh, you know, in, in the world. But what it does to the individual, okay, is it exasperates the mental, it makes things worse. And in fact, it maintains the, the problems. Okay, it breaks down families and relationships. It will eventually have this because once a person becomes addicted, okay, they will withdraw from many things. They won't be able to engage their family, the children, the wife, you know, or partners or whatever it is. Okay, uh, it breaks down their relationships, financial distress. Okay, because there'll be whatever they earn goes into trying to buy substances. It damages brain activity and health, and it causes death eventually. That's what it does. People once they're on substances stuck on substances they can't make good choices good decisions they become overwhelmed very quickly okay and they just want quick fixes to everything they don't have that patience um, or, or you know the, the skill to kind of go through and pick up the lessons that they need to but that's for the individual but for societal okay uh, it is a collective problem it's not just the individual's problem and the thing is is we need to ask ourselves what kind of a world do we want our children to grow up in or what kind of world do we want to live in ourselves Okay, so drug-related crime in society is one of the biggest things. They have massive, horrendous crimes associated with drugs and alcohol. Okay, the economic impact that it has, loss of jobs, finances, damages. You've seen all them canisters on the floor, damages to environment, okay, needles lying around. It impacts the younger generation, especially within families, okay, because the children, one of the things that they do is they, they learn by observing, okay, and if they find or they see that, you know, drugs and substances are, are used, to uh, deal with life problems, they pick that up, okay? And it, and it kind of, or they either witness things that happen within family homes, shouting, screaming, fight, violence, or whatever, they pick that up and it causes problems. It's generational trauma passed down, generation to generation. Okay, massive uh, cost on the healthcare services. Um, so it is a societal problem as well. So the importance of tackling the issue, okay? Uh, like I mentioned, it is a collective problem. Okay, it ruins families, tears apart communities, it has a tragic impact on people's livelihood. Okay, one of the reasons why we actually need to look at this is actually breaking all of this cycle. And, and it's kind of teaching people, uh, bettering society, bettering the whole country, bettering everyone's life, the community itself, okay, is through um, helping people develop these skills, okay, uh, supporting each other through this process. And what that does in, 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 in 
for, for us all, it makes a better environment. I'm a father of four children, four boys. Okay, my eldest now is 14. I, I'm, I'm scared, you know, when uh, some of the things... Because I've been... I'm in this all the time, and I hear some of the most horrendous stories, okay? My 9 to 5 is basically listening to people's life stories, okay? And l l listen to what they've been through, and it scares me sometimes. Uh, as a father, I worry for my 14-year-old. Every time he goes out, he's, 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 you know, it's like, so don't get involved in anything like this, you know? And it's, it's constantly keeping a tab on him. Um, I have kind of realized that because it, it, does, it does impact me a bit and I have to step back a bit. But the thing is, is it's still scary for any parent to know that there's, there's this kind of stuff going on outside. And it's not always, you know, whether you like it or whether we like it or not, okay? Um, you know, in the community when people interact, they are going to come across some of these things. So they will come across children from other, uh, whose parents might be users or other users or whatever. And it, it starts young. I mean, um, if you hear about all these kind of things that are going on in schools, now very common, the vape pens and stuff like this, okay? Some of these things have, you know, chemicals that we don't, we don't really understand yet because they're just quite new. Um, the impact of them, we're probably going to see, you know, years down the line. But it starts at some point and then it just goes on. So one of the, the, the reasons why we need to deal with this whole circumstance to make a wholesome environment for ourselves and for our, for our, our generations to come as well, that is going to be productive. So one of the reasons I was talking about um, the lack of engagement, okay, the lack of engagement that we're having. Um, <clears throat> within the South Asian community, as I mentioned, okay, on generally, uh, you know, the any non-white community, they, uh, they don't even make up a fraction of, 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 the, uh, of the statistics. It's because of the stigma that happens. Now, I have, you know, in the, in the, since I started at the service, okay, there was very few people. I think there was about one, one Asian uh, that was there. Um, after I've come, this, this number has increased. But the thing is, is what I've been out on, on in the community, I've had people that have come up to me and said, look, I need the support, okay? But the thing is, is, is there no alternative way of doing it? And the reason why is they don't want to walk through the doors. Uh, and when you ask them why, it's, it's because people are going to realise what's going on. Uh, okay, and there's always this kind of fear of, of being judged. Now, stigma is one of them things that it can happen where a person just feels disgrace, shame, okay, judgment, low self-esteem, low confidence. Um, but some of these people are in a very, very difficult place. Um, they feel that they're not understood by the community is that they when, when they kind of bring up that i've got this issue with drugs and alcohol people will say well just stop yeah and they don't i think they, they feel that they're not being understood that they just can't stop okay they don't have the option of just stopping sometimes um so it can be really difficult for them and, and for us for ourselves as well it's about understanding what what addiction is and sometimes especially the substance that a person is using can actually kill that individual so they can't don't always have the option of stopping you know when I, when you come out of recovery especially this can be very frustrating for a lot of people is they go what we kind of work on what is what we call a cycle of change okay and they come to a point where they maintain their absence but then something in life happens and they might lapse again and lapses can be quite common in substance misuse, especially in its uh, in its in its treatment, okay. Um, so as a community, is kind of understanding that even as people that are supporting a loved one or someone that we know through um, recovery is kind of understanding that there might come a point where they might actually use again, but they need to learn from that re that lapse and then move on from there as well. So stopping straight away is not always an option. Um, so. Yeah, it can be personal reputation. People don't want to come in. Obviously, they don't want to know what goes on in, uh, in this. And this is, um, uh, you know, this stigma, okay? I mean, for men in our community is one thing. You know, for women, it's even higher, okay? Um, and for some reason, I don't know, but I, from my experience, I've seen that women in the South Asian community are, are kind of stigmatized even more than any of the women in, uh, you know, any of the community. It just, it's just how it is. Like if a man's smoking, no one bats an eyelid. If a woman, a Pakistani or uh, Bengali woman is smoking then all of a sudden there's all sorts of associations that are made that are kind of horrendous so this just that's just a cigarette but you know with things like accessing drug service and unfortunately like i said you know addiction is one thing and the addict is another the addict is human okay they get pulled into these kind of things and it's that promise of 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 of, of, of being in a better place or you know uh, things working out or or you can just walk away from it later on it's just something that we do for fun 
you know, and it gets they get pulled into that, and then all of a sudden they get sucked in. And with with women, it might be just you know through wanting relationships or uh, you know um, getting pulled in, or he'll be okay once you know things work out, or and get pulled into it, and then you know the things that are associated with drugs and alcohol are really horrendous. Some of the things that are here sometimes struggle actually relaying um, because of the appropriateness of them. But it is a horrendous thing, and like I said, it's a it's a world of lies and deceit. Uh, you know, they promised one thing and they delivered another, and it's just how it is. Uh, and then once a person is entered into it, um, then it's just exploitation uh, from different things, and there's blackmail and all sorts that goes on. So you know, there's there's a bit of stigma about using this. Now with high level, we'll talk about this in the confidentiality issue on the on, as we go along. But one of the things that we can do to help reduce the stigma, okay, is just Kind of be supportive towards people that might be struggling and going through that and i know it's difficult like i said because addiction is one of them things where there's a lot of people that are harmed in the process um, but kind of displaying kindness to people in vulnerable situations listening while preserving judgment okay um, every addict has a story sometimes we just see the superficial side of it oh he's just using alcohol he's drinking alcohol sometimes we don't hear what happens why they're actually at that point or what's actually happened to them and when you listen to that sometimes, you'll have a different perspective on how you actually view that individual. Um, seeing a person for who they are, not what, what, what drugs they use. Generally in life, okay, you get good and bad people. A person can have one bad quality, but can have ten good ones, okay? And sometimes it's vice versa, but it's kind of looking beyond just the drug use. Because there is something in everyone that's worth salvaging. You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of qualities within addicts. One of the biggest things I've learned about addiction is this. Is when an addict goes through his recovery, he learns one thing that he has, which is puts him above anyone else, and that's self-control. Um, you know, because they learn to self to control themselves and not use again. How many of us are kind of going to uh, diets? Diet starts as a famous saying: diet starts on Monday, okay, and then it starts that Monday that never comes. But we get hungry, we need to eat. It's the same thing with the addict. You know, when the when that underlying cause flares up or when that need to do that pain flares up, they can't help themselves. But what they learn through the recovery process is self-control, uh, you know, and that's a massive thing that is uh, being able to control your, your own self. Um, kind of learning about what drug dependency is, okay, and just kind of avoiding hurtful terms, you know, like uh, that can be associated with substance misuse. So this is hopefully something that we can kind of uh, maybe take something back from and just kind of pick up on. Uh, if anyone does kind of reach out to us, the reason why I know that not everyone that's some, uh, you know, that might be using substance is going to be necessarily in the mosque, but we all know people, okay, and it's just kind of learning how to deal with this situation around stigma. So, High Level Northern Trust, what is it? It's a charity, okay, it's been in Rochdale for over t uh, over 20 years now, okay, uh, and like I said, it's on Drake Street, it's in Chapman's Hall, you're welcome if you're passing by to pop, pop in. It is, a, it is a, a confidential service, okay, and it's a free service, there's no charge to anyone. Now, when we look at confidentiality, because I mentioned this about stigma, and I have to, I have to say this, um, we from ourselves will never ever identify any of our service users, so if, like, if there was I ever met anyone that actually attended the service, I wouldn't just walk past them like I never knew them. So we wouldn't, do, we wouldn't pass any of that information to anyone uh, at all. However, obviously coming in, we, people know that there's a drugs and alcohol service within Chapman's Hall. Um, and people could question, you know, where you're going. And it's about kind of developing, uh, maybe just putting something forward that there's other organisations and other stuff within Chapman's Hall. People could say they're going in there. That's what we generally tell them. But we from ourselves would never ever give you information to anyone. Um, so if anyone wanted to use that service, we are a confidential service. Confidentiality always has its limitations, okay? So when it comes to like self-harm, harm to other individuals, money trafficking, uh, drug loan, uh, money laundering, drug trafficking and stuff like this, obviously we have to breach it by law, but other than that we are a very confidential service. Um, high level is very unique in the way it deals with substances as well, okay, or substance misuse, because it looks at it from a very holistic perspective, okay? Now high level is not geared towards any part of, uh, of, 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 of society itself, it's for everyone, okay? And the reason why is because addiction doesn't discriminate, okay? It doesn't discriminate. And there's no general kind of um, image for an addict. I mean, when you talk about alcohol misuse or whatever, and people might have this image in, of, a, of a guy uh, who's dressed like, you know, a, a not very good with a brown bag sitting on a park bench somewhere. And, have, and that's not true because you have high-flying 
uh, high functioning uh, uh, alcoholics as well and you can have addicts in every background uh, you can have them in professional roles doctors teachers lawyers uh, accountants okay and you can have uh, people that are absolutely homeless as well so it doesn't discriminate male female it doesn't go off race color anything like that um, it's one of them things it's that, that tonic that just tears people's lives apart uh, um, so we recognize this in high level so we have something for everyone in a sense but one of the things that it does okay is one-on-one -on -one support with every individual and, and that comes at looking at what their addiction is how how it's formed and what we can do to help it um, this outbound referrals care plans the solution focused uh, approach it's mindset change it's having a different look outlook on life and how we can deal with problems the other thing that we do is obviously like I said about the addict point in quick fixes there's a, there's things around them not being able to relax or unwind or uh, switch off from these things so one of the things that we do have is uh, holistic therapies okay uh, and it could be hot stone massages therapeutic back massage reflexology holistic facials guided meditation they have all of these things they're all free to access within the service that a person can have um, there's a counseling service within high level and looks at mental health uh, coping strategies remember we said about unhealthy coping strategies about retraining the mind of the addict to of how you can deal with life and how you can deal with situations um, and to do that we have obviously different modalities of therapies that we have so it's neuro linguistic program cognitive behavior therapy hypnotherapy um, there's person centered counseling there's quite a different few different things that they have um, that's for kind of individual there's also group therapies relapse prevention that's a group that I run on the Mondays uh, there's personal development, well-being groups, anger management, volunteer training. We have acupuncture as well. So uh, it's a regular acupuncture that's around the ears with the needles going. Helps people to relax, helps clear the mind, clear the thoughts. Um, there's activity groups that they can do with high level. So if you look at on again going back in the presentation towards the unhealthy coping coping strategies, people use distraction, and these are a healthy form of distractions where people can go fishing, they can go do arts and crafts, yoga, qigong which is like tai chi, quiz games, there's day trips that they can go out and stuff. So there's all of these kind of activities that happen within high level that people can get engaged with. It's not compulsory for anyone to engage with the specific one. They can pick and choose whatever person or individual feels comfortable doing. Um, now one of the things that sets high level very apart from other organisations, very unique, is that we have a, a service that supports concerned others. Now what I mentioned earlier on is addiction is one of them things that harms not just the addict but people around the addict as well, okay? So it could be family members, it could be brothers, sisters, children, parents, it could be anyone. And what High Level does is help them as well. And what it, how it does that is it shows a, 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 you know, the loved one or the person how they can support the individual that, they, that is struggling, okay? And how they can actually support themselves and look after themselves. Um, there's a knowledge around enabling, but sometimes, you know, in our endeavours to try and stop people, um, we can actually push them further away or we can give them the means to which they can start abusing uh, substances as well. There's coping strategies that they can use, there's education on uh, addiction, there's peer export, there's signposting about other organisations. There's something that we have as a service, we have a group for them that runs on a Thursday as well, in which people that are supporting someone through addiction can come in and access and there's like a whole group room where they can you know get support from each other and, and pick up basic knowledge on what they need to know the another thing like i said about high level it deals with people from all walks of life okay and that can be from homelessness to a professional place but one of the things that it has is a 24 uh, well not 24 hours but it's um you know a drop-in drop-in common room that people could come in we normally open from eight till four uh, monday to friday and they can come in at any time um, what it is is a nice warm place for them that they can sit down, they can socialise, they can get support from others. If they're struggling with food, they can get food vouchers. Um, we have lunches that are provided daily. There's a vegetarian option and a meat option as well. Tea and coffee, basically they can have There's regular activities that they can do. There's arts and crafts, colouring and stuff. So basically they've just got a place where they can come, sit, socialise, help them overcome loneliness, keep them warm as well uh, and it keeps them safe as well. So this is one of the things that another service that High Level has. Now, how you can access the service, okay, we are actually on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, the links to the to the service are all on, on there where people can self-refer. Um, or you can just call in to the service and, and, and you know refer yourself or refer a person that, that needs support. Uh, 
uh, and they can access the service. But we are on social media, and I would recommend that you know if you do go on, have a look at it as well. They're, they're on YouTube as well, actually, uh, so you can have a look at some of the the um, feedback that we had from other other people as well. Um, so do definitely do check us out. Um, I think that's pretty much the end. Have I did I, I think I did did I do forty minutes? Yeah. Um, but I'll take any questions, inshallah, that you've got. Yeah. Yeah.